Are Nano Bubbles the Secret to Optimal Health, Wellness, and Mental Performance? Over a thousand scientific studies say yes. Molecular hydrogen, or Nano Bubbles, reduce the number one cause of cognitive decline, premature aging, and tired looking skin by destroying the most damaging free radicals. Vital Reaction Hydrogen Tablets transform ordinary water or any non carbonated drink into cell optimizing hydrogen water. If you'd like to try hydrogen for the next 30 days risk free, Go to TryVitalReaction.com. Use the discount code GENIUS to save 20% on your first order. Note, all orders are protected with a one-year money-back guarantee and include free shipping. So use the code GENIUS to save 20% on your first purchase at TryVitalReaction.com. Forget frequently asked questions. Common sense. Common knowledge. Or Google. How about advice from a real genius? 95% of people in any profession are good enough to be qualified and licensed. 5% go above and beyond. They become very good at what they do. But only 0.1% are real geniuses. Richard Jacobs has made it his life's mission to find them for you. He hunts down and interviews geniuses in every field. Sleep science, cancer, stem cells, ketogenic diets, and more. Here come the geniuses. This is the Finding Genius Podcast with Richard Jacobs. Hello, this is Richard Jacobs with the Finding Genius Podcast, now part of the Finding Genius Foundation. I have Alexander Anderson, PhD. Uh, He goes by Sandy. He's um, the chair of uh, Integrated Mathematical Oncology at uh, Moffitt, and we're going to talk about his work with uh, mathematical modeling of cancer. So, Sandy, thanks for coming. Great to be here. If you would, give me a bit about your background. How did you decide to combine math and modeling and cancer? Yeah, that's a long story, but I'll try and make it short. Um, During my master's, which was in mathematical biology, I got interested in the idea of being able to use mathematical models to predict, you know, treatments or sort of significant changes to a patient over time. In this case, in my master's, I was looking at atrial fibrillation, otherwise known as a heart attack. And one could mathematically model that and see the conditions for when that would occur and then how could one stop that happening. Um, and that inevitably led me to, to doing a PhD. But there I really focused on looking at worms, nematodes. And that's where I got interested in heterogeneity because I was looking at nematode movement through the soil, which is a very heterogeneous environment. And I got to work directly with an experimentalist there who basically was going to do all the experiments for my theory. So I had to learn very quickly to be able to speak to biologists. And I think that training served me very well when I started working on cancer, which was through my postdoc with Mark Chaplin at University of Bath at the time. And the funny thing about that is the way that nematodes find plant is very similar to the way that blood vessels find tumours. So they're driven by chemoattractants. Of course, a nematode is a little worm, solitary worm in a blood vessel, a contiguous vessel that uh, grows and supplies a tumour with the nutrients it needs to grow. Um, But that kind of modelling of angiogenesis then opened up this whole world of of cancer research that got me very interested in in understanding the dialogue between a growing tumour and its changing environment and how the tumour changes its environment as it grows and invades into it. And really the question, think, the nematode is just following the steepest gradient of chemicals? Is that how they navigate? Basically, there's gradients of carbon dioxide off of these plant roots and they just, well, you know, they don't need to see it because they just move up that. And they do this kind of, it's almost like a random walk, a sort of spiral walk, but um, they keep reorientating as they move in and out of those gradients and, and eventually find their food source. And of course, they're a big problem for potatoes. <laughs> they kind of tend to find those potato roots and swarm and destroy them. The point was there that trying to use mathematics to understand complex biological phenomena kind of got me hooked early on. And so can seem to me was a, an area where we could use mathematics. And then the more I got interested in looking at how cancers grow and invade, the more I realized that if we could develop treatments that would also manipulate the environment as well as go after or target the cancer, we'd potentially do much better. And so the kind of tumor microenvironment field that time, and this would have been in the kind of like 
early 2000s or sort of late late 90s was still somewhat growing. It's now fairly accepted the tumour microenvironment is equally as important as the tumour itself. But, you know, for many treatments for cancers, we just focus on targeting the tumour and going after the tumour and we ignore the context that the tumour is creating or the modifications that it's made to that environment. And so that's something that more and more now we're, we're thinking about, well, how does this treatment impact the stromal cells or the fibroblasts that are around the tumour? How does this treatment impact the immune response as a result of targeting this tumour? Can we leverage that? Can we exploit that by giving a certain way? And that kind of tumour microenvironment dialogue is another reason why I got very interested in cancer evolution and how cancer... If you you consider a a tumour a spheroid, just for the sake of mathematical modelling, the centre is anoxic, you know, any rings of material outside of it spherically would be its microenvironment. So when you're talking about microenvironment, you're just looking at the edge of cells, the tumor, and then the rest of the body, or internally to the tumor, there are multiple and microbes changes as you go out radially through the tumor. Yeah, a very kind of vague term, I guess, in many ways, but I guess the micro aspect sort of tries to channel a little bit to the the immediate environment around and within the tumour. So as you say, you know, many cancers have necrotic or hypoxic conditions within them, but they may have a leading edge that's quite rich in nutrients. But it's, it's not more than just metabolism, it's also the other cell types that are present, the non-tumor cell types, the fibroblasts, the immune cells, the extracellular matrix, you know, the, the connective tissue that the tumor is invading. The fact that the tumor initiates within a duct or whether it or a crypt, you know, the architecture of that has an impact on its ability to grow and invade into that tissue. Yeah, it makes sense. So when you look at microenvironment, are you just looking at modeling the gradients of various chemicals that seem to be present there? Or, you know, if there's microbial constituents, that would, I mean, I guess you could model them in terms of their metabolites, but how do you model that where you have, again, very likely microbial constituents, you know, other organisms in the vicinity? Yeah, and so that's really, you know, that kind of dialogue requires somewhat more sophisticated modeling approaches. So historically, you know, cancer models have been very focused on sort of growth laws where you ignore spatial aspects and just think about the tumor in terms of its overall size or number of cells and really distill that down to just a single number. And in reality, we know the tumor is a kind of very dynamic, heterogeneous mass that contains very different metabolic environments, as well as it interacting with many different cellular and microenvironmental aspects that are non-tumor. And so one of the areas I've focused quite a lot of research on in looking at this dialogue is using agent-based approaches. And so these effectively allow you to represent cells as agents and sort of imbue those agents with processes and properties that you know those types of cells have and how they'll interact, what they'll secrete, what factors they need, what nutrients they require. And then effectively you can simulate these complex interacting systems under different conditions. And so that leads to fairly sophisticated models, but One of the great unifying and simplifying aspects of those models is where you have to impose a kind of homeostasis on them. So the idea that under normal conditions, that tissue should maintain itself and its integrity. And if it's wounded, it should heal. So in the absence of cancer, it shouldn't just grow and keep growing. It should maintain some stable number. It should maintain some stable structure because, you know, that's what happens in our tissues. They they keep themselves in check. And so that kind of homeostatic regulation is a great way of, in some sense, controlling the complexity of these models. And then when you add cancer to that, then there's a bit of a sort of fight that goes on between the homeostatic control mechanisms and the rogue sort of tumor cell that's trying to hijack them. So looking at that sort of sophisticated dialogue requires those types of, you know, more sophisticated models like agent-based approaches.
Are Nano Bubbles the Secret to Optimal Health, Wellness, and Mental Performance? Over a thousand scientific studies say yes. Molecular hydrogen, or nanobubbles, reduce the number one cause of cognitive decline, premature aging, and tired looking skin by destroying the most damaging free radicals. Vital reaction hydrogen tablets transform ordinary water or any non carbonated drink into cell optimizing hydrogen water. If you'd like to try hydrogen for the next 30 days risk free, go to tryvitalreaction.com. Use the discount code GENIUS to save 20% on your first order. Note all orders are protected with a one year money back guarantee and include free shipping. So use the code GENIUS to save 20% on your first purchase at tryvitalreaction.com. How sophisticated have your models been and what is your model? Is it in a mouse, in a worm, in a person? All right, okay. You know, what kind of cancer? This is an in silico model that I was talking about there. So, you know, we develop all sorts of models, truthfully, and we work with all sorts of data. So we work with cell lines in, in a dish, in a, in a flask. We work with them in spheroids, in three-dimensional spheroids, or in sophisticated three-dimensional organoids that involve not just tumor cells, but other components of that environment. And then, of course, we work with animals and we work with patient data. Um, So all of those scales are considered, and it depends on the specific cancer, how much or if all of those scales are covered. So, for example, in prostate cancer, we have lots of preclinical data in animals as well as in cell lines. And we have a lot of patient data where we've been evolving, we've been given these sort of evolutionary therapeutic approaches. In melanoma, we have a lot of sort of organoid type models as well as sort of 3D culture, as well as cells in culture, just 2D culture, and then animal models. And again, patient data. I was going to ask you, yeah, if you use organoids, it seems like a simple model would be just have a... um you know, an organoid of uh, whatever tissue and then put some nutrient in the dish at different orientations and see how it responds maybe to just start the modeling process. But yeah, that's good using organoids, at least for melanoma. Yeah, I mean, that's an interesting point that you bring up because so organoids require very special conditions to grow and be maintained because, you know, they are containing a kind of complex ecology of different cell types other than just the tumor cells. And they're kind of representing different features of that organ that the cancer is coming from, right? And so that often requires very select environments. So you can't just change the environment willy-nilly. You have to sort of tune it to make it sort of nice for these organoids to, to form. And, you know, that's that's one of the, the big issues with using patient-derived cells is that they often require very special handling because they only like certain environments. But they're all part of our modeling tool set, right? You know, they're incorrect in some way. They don't quite describe the real patient behavior, but they give us some insights. And so, you know, I think provided you integrate those different tools with our in silico approaches, then we can actually make useful insights that can be played out in a patient in the clinic. It seems like you'd have to incorporate exosome production. And I don't know what they call the process of taking in extracellular vesicles into a cell. But from what I understand, I mean, cells in the body spit out tens of thousands and, you know, suck in tens of thousands in a day. And that could be an incredibly significant part of the communication and the, uh, you know, the interaction, not just metabolites. So how do you model all this? We don't actually model the exosome dynamics, but one of the things that we do do is we allow our our cells to evolve and change over time at the phenotypic level. So depending on what the phenotype you're looking at, let's say if we're talking, say we're talking about the phenotype of drug resistance, right, or drug sensitivity. And so as you apply your treatment, there's going to be some subpopulation of cells which potentially could become more resistant as a result of, say, such exosome activity or, or they could escape very harsh environmental conditions or something by changing things like their metabolism or utilizing other nutrient sources. And so we don't maybe explicitly model all those aspects, but one could sort of argue that it's folded into this ability of these cells to evolve their phenotype gradually over time. 
and then selection does the job of, of picking the fittest phenotypes for that context. One of the important questions that emerges from that, though, is the speed of evolution. How quickly can that phenotype change? And it's sort of not unrealistic, right? So wait, wait, wait a second. You said nematodes, for instance, will use their own heuristic to navigate gradients. So why would you then just say when it gets to the cellular level, oh, now it's just selection doing it. And it's not the cell sensing and following gradients itself. Oh, no. So the cells can move and find. So, you know, I, I get it depends on the specific process we're talking about. If you're talking about chemotaxis or migration, one of the things that I think is worth highlighting here is that, you know, a tumor is generally a complex, contiguous mass where there's certainly movement, but how much movement's actually occurring? Is it really at the invading edge where all the action is? And how much of that's driven by, say, growth factor gradients or nutrient gradients or chemokine gradients? All of that sort of spatially, dynamically changing in three dimensions, right? You know, how much of that do we want to capture to be able to say something practical about, say, a treatment choice, right? So if, if you're all your modeling or what you're specifically interested in is, say, invasion, and you want to model that process in real detail, then you might want to build a model that also considers tissue mechanics and that wants to look at, you know, viscosity and um, other aspects of the extracellular matrix and how those different cells are adhering to and pulling on and aligning fibers in the matrix and so on. And so the, the kind of detail and resolution of your model should be placed on the specific question you want to ask. And I guess in my mind, I was thinking about a treatment question as opposed to, say, an invasion question. But you're right. If one wanted to go look at sort of, say, tumor invasion question, you might be more interested in thinking about spatial gradients or chemokine gradients or even growth factor gradients. One major division I see is cell to environment interactions and then cell to cell signaling within the context of the cell to environment interaction. So if you have, you know, a very simple setup, I don't know which forces will dominate, but it seems like those are the two ends of the model. And, I, you know, unfortunately, biology is so complicated. I'm sure it incorporates tremendous amounts of both. But, you know, how do you approach this? Do you approach it? Is that an accurate description of the two endpoints and the two sides of the model? Again, cell to environment versus cell to cell signaling? Yeah, I mean, I think that's definitely one way to look at it. I think that even, you know, every cell is going to experience an environment. Like the cellular phenotype is context driven, whether you're surrounded by cells or by only context, right? You can't escape that aspect. But I think um, depending on how transformed that cell is, like how far gone it is in terms of its cancer state, it still might be regulated by some of the baseline developmental mechanisms of what that cell is. So, you know, so for, for many cancers, it's an epithelial cell, but, you know, once it's completely transformed, those cells can do all sorts of things. And, you know, the kind of one of the classic changes, of course, is to, to become a more mesenchymal-like migratory phenotype. But I think distilling it down to cell to cell interactions versus cell to environment interactions is actually quite a nice simplification. The unfortunate problem there is that cell to cell never occurs without cell to environment. And so how do you balance those two in terms of, you know, what a cell phenotype decision is? So, you know, the way we've done that is to give the cell a bunch of traits, cellular traits such as say, its proliferative capacity, its migratory capacity, how adhesive it is to other cells, how much nutrients it consumes, how much proteins it, proteases it secretes. Or, of course, it depends on the question you're asking, but one can imagine you can build up a number of cellular properties that then are changed based on who the cell's interacting with and what context it's in. It'll behave a different way depending on what those signals are. Yeah, but now you have a, another layer of complexity. So if you have a single cell, we could say cell to environment versus cell to cell communication. But if you have a tumor and you have cells that are similar enough that they kind of form this aggregate structure, yeah. and then you have other cells, meaning non-tumor, non-healthy cells, there's also that layer of communication. You know, like bacteria have quorum sensing and they know who is self and who is other. 
Yeah. So within cells, there's probably also that complexity too. Well, there's definitely uh, polarity is, is a big driver in, in sort of cell behavior, right? So knowing whether you're inside or outside. And of course, a duct structure where many of these cancers originate. So think of breast or prostate or lung or whatever. You know, there's a definite polarity there that gets destroyed as those cells breach their basement membranes of those ducts and start to invade. Um, And they're now interacting with cells that they've never interacted with before, right? So there's a huge transformation in context that those cells overcome. And of course, signals that they start to receive as a result of that. And that's really a kind of bigger question, I think, about how much of that dialogue does one want to include? And again, it comes back to what's the specific question you want to ask? Or you want to look at a treatment sort of scenario where you're trying to think about the sequence of drugs, or you want to think about initiation stage or the breach of the basement membrane stage and and then maybe what are the elements of the model that I want to build to try and answer that question and so for example in in the treatment scenario maybe it's good enough to treat the tumor as like a big contiguous mass and all I'm caring about is the fact that there's two different clones, one which is more sensitive and one which is more resistant to the treatment I'm going to give and where are those clones located and and how much competition are they going to feel as that tumour grows and as I treat it, right? And and so that then drives different type of modelling approaches. And so that's where the kind of model complexity is tuned to the question you want to ask. A good example of that is we were very interested in looking at the dialogue between cancer-associated fibroblasts in prostate cancer and sort of the early initiating and then subsequent invasion events in prostate cancer. And so there's we had some patient samples from different scores, Gleason scores, which is to do with different levels of aggression of the tumor. And within that, those patients had their whole prostates removed. So we were able to then go back and stain. And you would see that some of the, the ducts within those prostates contained very early sort of, let's say, um, not fully invasive aspects of prostate cancer yet. And then but within the same prostate had other ducts that were fully invaded and breached and broken out of. And then we could look at the amount of stroma that surrounded those cells and those different ducts, and we could look at that across different levels of aggressiveness in those tumours. And so we built a kind of agent-based model that looked at cancer-associated fibroblasts and their kind of interactions with those ducts in the prostate and tried to describe the biology of that process and showed that, you know, without the tumors breaching, you got kind of more or less like normal behavior. But once they breach, you get this dialogue between these cancer associated fibroblasts that really facilitates the invasion of these cells, of these tumor cells in the prostate. And an interesting subtlety that emerged from that model was that if the calves have differing degrees of how aggressive they are. So imagine you've got a a kind of, let's call it a less aggressive calf, like a a close to normal fibroblast. It doesn't secrete too much growth factor, doesn't invade too much, it behaves, versus a very aggressive one that produces a bunch of growth factors, helps secrete a bunch of matrix-degrading enzymes and actually facilitates the tumor's invasion. And so it turned out that if you had those differences, then it really mattered the state of the tumor in terms of how it could exploit either good or bad calves. And we were able to then go back and look at the data and stain for those subtleties and find that indeed, um, when you had very aggressive Gleason 9 tumors, um, they didn't actually need the calves to help them because they were already really nasty. But when you had these intermediate Gleason 7s, it really benefited you if you had these more aggressive calves versus if you had less aggressive calves. And so, you know, that kind of dialogue there required the complexity in fibroblast modeling and, uh, you know, tumor structure. Whereas in another one, we might have not needed that spatial complexity. Yeah. I mean, so what kind of useful heuristics or things that, you know, what have the models shown you maybe that's common to many cellular masses or tissue agglomerations? Like what have you seen that's useful? That's a big question. Let me think about that. I mean, I think an obvious 
question relevant to tr- like say all treatments right you know the tr- all the treatment models that we've developed and looked at an obvious question is is resistance already present or not right so that's a crucial thing to be able to understand and um, how large is the resistant population at the start of treatment how encapsulated is that resistant population by a more sensitive population um, how dispersed is the tumor prior to treatment how, how fragmented is it if you like that seems to be those all seem to be very crucial in regardless of the cancer having a direct impact on how responsive it is to treatment yeah, I mean, again, have you found anything useful or is it just so complicated that you're not there yet? Or, you know, do you need well, you to know, increase the complexity of the models? Like, what- No, no. So the thing is that I don't mean to give the impression that we need more complex models to be able to do anything useful for our patients. That's not the case. In fact, ironically, when it comes to patient data, because we actually have minimal data on patients in reality, right? So if you think about it, when a patient's been treated for cancer, they'll come in and get their treatment, which might be once a month that they'll come in to get that treatment, or maybe even once every two weeks. And during that time, you can potentially get a blood sample. Every six to eight weeks, you might get an image of their disease. And depending on the cancer, there might be some nice biomarker in that blood sample that will give you a rough idea of how responsive the tumor is. So, you know, you can't build too sophisticated a model when that's all you've got, right? And so we often resort to using simple differential equation-based models or game-theoretic models when we're dealing with patients. But we do think about the ecological interactions and the aspects that our more sophisticated models have, have taught us as we build those more simplified models and then try and fit our models to the patient dynamic and then make predictions about what treatment strategies should be deployed. And one of the kind of, I'd say, overarching things that emerges from that, crucially, is that giving the maximum tolerated dose of the drug is, in fact, the worst possible idea that you could use. And so, say, say that again. What's the worst possible idea? The maximum tolerated dose. So, like, Oh, uh, okay. Why, right, why is that? So right now, it, almost every cancer is treated with what's called MTD, the maximum tolerated dose, because the idea is if I kill everything, then everything will be fine and will be cured, right? But of course, MTD or that maximum tolerated dose, what that does is very, very quickly selects for resistance. So you wipe out everything that in fact is sensitive to that drug and leave behind everything that is resistant to that drug. And so much smarter strategy, which we can learn from pest management. So, you know, crop people that grow crops and and care about looking after their crops have been doing this for like half a century, where basically they don't spray the entire field with pesticide because if they do, they'll very quickly get resistant pests. And so what they do is they only partially spray the field. They give up, say, like a, a quarter or a fifth of the field to the pests and let them eat it and live there, but spray the rest of it. And so you you kind of got, you lose something, but the rest of the field is fine. And then the next year, what happens is that that pest that was sort of survived in that part of the field takes over the, the rest of the field again, and you can respray the following year. And so that similar strategy, which we call evolutionary therapy, or in this case, one specific evolutionary therapy is adaptive, is the idea that you would, rather than give the maximum tolerated dose, you give what we call the minimum effective dose. So it's like spraying part of the field. So you only give partial drug. You only give a smaller amount of the drug. And Yeah, but if, I, um, if, if the nature of cancer is to evolve away and around from, let's say, chemotherapies, for instance, yeah, I understand why maximum tolerable is not helpful, but I don't know. Is it a factor just minimum versus maximum? Or is it that you have to include you know, five or six different drugs in a cocktail, but maybe now you can put them all at minimum effective dose. And now it will cut off the escape routes of the cancer's adaptation. Yeah, so that's a great point. So I think that we're thinking about monotherapies um, as opposed to, say, sequential or combination therapies. With monotherapies, one thing we can do is give the drug, then stop treatment altogether. Then when the tumor starts to regrow again, 
give the treatment again. And then when it stops growing or it fall, falls below some threshold, stop the treatment again. And that's actually a clinical trial that Bob Gattenby here has been doing for six years now on metastatic castrate-resistant prostate cancer, where they've been given this drug abiraterone intermittently. But importantly, it's not just a fixed intermittent rate. They switch the treatment on and off depending on the individual patient's response. And what they've been able to show there is they've been of the 16 patients on the trial, they've been able to extend the time to progression by over two years and they've used less than half the drug. So that's a great example of how kind of evolutionary therapy can, can directly impact response. But coming back to your point about multiple drugs, so that's something that, again, thinking about this evolution from an evolutionary angle, when you treat with one drug, the tumor will try and adapt and evade that to that drug by, you know, exploiting some other, say, pathway or mechanism, depending what the drug is. So if you know that escape route is, you can then now hit it with another drug that goes after that escape route. And you can potentially keep doing that. Eventually, you're going to run out of drugs because cancer is always going to find a way through evolution. So what you really don't want to do is keep facilitating resistance at every turn. So being smart about switching the drug before resistance emerges, but say there's some dependency, um, you know, some escape has been made, but it's not fully resistant. So you've still got options to go back to that first drug in the future. And so we've been thinking about sort of almost cycles of drugs where you sequence a set of drugs in what we call an evolutionary cycle. You basically give, say, three or four different drugs in a certain order that you can then repeat. You can keep doing that and it'll keep the cancer under control for far longer than just, say, giving any one of those drugs at the maximum tolerated dose or sequencing them all at maximum tolerated dose without thinking smartly about how the tumor's response dynamics are and how you should change your treatment as a result of that response dynamic. And you're able to model resistance. So you know you give drug A, the resistance will tend to lead the cancer along these two or three additional paths. Are you able to do that and then get ahead of it? So let's say drug A will lead to resistance and then drug B is what's next. Maybe do that a lot sooner or do the amount of A lower and then do B immediately when you know it's it's just about to become resistant and not let the resistance set in. And let's say, you know, let's say 100,000 cells that become resistant. If you catch it fast enough versus several billion, would that help? Yeah, that definitely helps. And that's something that, you know, resistance is probably not binary. It's probably not, yes, I'm resistant. No, I'm not. It's probably shades of sensitivity, right? From say zero sensitivity to true resistance to somewhere in between where there is kind of partially sensitive, right? As opposed to being completely sensitive. And so the implication then is, can we shape that population by sequencing drugs, either in isolation or combining drugs in a certain order to exploit evolution. So we know, for example, if we give this targeted therapy, that the escape route is through another pathway, which I actually have a drug for, that I know then I can give that drug and it will target the cells that are escaping the first drug. And so that sort of idea of an evolutionary double bind where, um, you know, by, by giving the first drug, I've forced them to go down a certain route that's made them more susceptible to the second drug. Right, exactly. Yeah. Like uh, herding cattle into a box canyon or something. Yeah. And so, so that kind of evolutionary therapeutic approach is something that we're focusing a lot on right now. And one possibility is then, can we actually get to some like cure or extinction? Because you basically sequence the drugs in, a, in such a way that you effectively eradicate the disease. You, you get rid of the cancer altogether. And it's different right. from maximum tolerated dose in the sense of MTD strategies tend to be I hit you with this drug until this drug fails, and now I'll go to the next drug and do the same thing. And I keep doing that. Whereas some of these sort of ideas that we're working with right now, this extinction strategy would be you give the first drug because you know you get the maximum kill on that drug, and then you stop before it stops killing. So, like, you know, you don't want it to rebound. And now I hit with the next effect. 
and then I keep that. And you also start going. the next one earlier, right? Yes, yeah, so exactly. Build up. And, and you keep going, and basically, once you get the tumor under control in terms of very small numbers of cells, the population is much more susceptible now to receiving or being hurt by other drugs that maybe it wouldn't be if it was a much larger mass where it was being protected by the group, so to speak. Right. So, you know, and that's something that we see. These are lessons that we're learning from ecology. And there's a thing called, you know, so like there's a lot of people who work on extinction, of course, and ecology. They're doing it in a way to try and stop extinction occurring. We don't want that happening. And there's this thing called the extinction vortex, which is basically once those species or whatever it is gets to very, very small numbers, there's certain things which would never have driven them to extinction if they were at normal numbers start to really become important. Things like, you know, slightly extended summers or, you know, slight changes in temperature or, you know. Or just competitors, you know, like yeah, the group of, of X yeah. is small enough. Now the competitors can dominate and push them exactly. out. You know? Exactly. And so that's sort of what we're thinking. Can we leverage that in cancer? Um, and again, that's where the mathematical models become very useful because they allow us to play out all sorts of scenarios and understand what's feasible versus what's not. But ultimately, you know, the, the heterogeneity of a patient and the reality of the kind of time scales of how patients respond is very different to what can be done in the lab, either theoretically or in animals. And so there's always an element of you're having to retune those models to the patient dynamics. Well, very good, Sandy. We're, we're just about out of time, but this is really fascinating. Good way for people to follow up and find out more. Well, my other hat that I wear is the director of the Center of Excellence for Evolutionary Therapy. We have a, a website there. You can also look at the Integrative Mathematical Oncology's website. Um, and we also run a, a blog there that's for the mathematical oncology community in general. And that's mathematical-oncology.org. We're always putting out new papers that's not just from my department, but from all over the world that people are doing this type of science, sharing the latest and greatest. And there's a, a blog there. There is subgroups tied to the Society for Maths Biology. And there's also online presentations that you can watch and learn. So it's all there for free. Well, very good, Sandy. Thank you so much for coming on the podcast. No problem. It's a pleasure talking to you. Are nanobubbles the secret to optimal health, wellness, and mental performance? Over a thousand scientific studies say yes. Molecular hydrogen, or nanobubbles, reduce the number one cause of cognitive decline premature aging, and tired-looking skin by destroying the most damaging free radicals. Vital Reaction Hydrogen Tablets transform ordinary water or any non-carbonated drink into cell-optimizing hydrogen water. If you'd like to try hydrogen for the next 30 days risk-free, go to tryvitalreaction.com. Use the discount code GENIUS to save 20% on your first order. Note all orders are protected with a one-year money-back guarantee and include free shipping. So use the code GENIUS to save 20% on your first purchase at TryVitalReaction.com. You've been listening to the Finding Genius Podcast with Richard Jacobs. If you like what you hear, be sure to review and subscribe to the Finding Genius Podcast on iTunes or wherever you listen to podcasts. And want to be smarter than everybody else? Become a premium member at FindingGeniusPodcast.com. This podcast is for information only. No advice of any kind is being given. Any action you take or don't take as a result of listening is your sole responsibility. Consult professionals when advice is needed.